Okay, good. So let's see. I, I'm deliberately going quite slowly. Is this okay? Anyone bored? Okay, that's good. Because I may not get to the end in the time I've got, but maybe that doesn't matter. Probably doesn't matter, does it? I mean, I, I could talk for hours about stuff, giving you sort of 10 seconds on each topic, bang, 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 bang. And at the end of the day, you'd remember nothing. Yeah? So it's probably better to remember a little bit than, remember every, than not remember anything. Yeah? So, so I might not get to the end. So the, this topic is a bit longer, but um, it's something that I find really fascinating. And I'm going to see if this computer actually can do this for me. Boom. There we are. That's hyperlinks for you. Amazing, isn't it? So this is the second topic, um, which is twisted PCFs and the angular momentum of light. So this is all about putting a twist on light. And one of the funny things about English is that lots of words have double meanings. Twisted, every murder has a mark. Has anyone seen this movie? I don't think I have. Probably somebody has, no? It's probably a really bad movie. I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> So we're putting a twist on light, but this is not that kind of twist. It's a different twist. So just, just a couple of obvious things that maybe some of you have not thought about. Um, chiral structures like springs and so on. There's something very weird about them. You, you think, well, if I flip them around, they're going to look different. But they look exactly the same when you flip them around. It doesn't matter what the orientation is, pointing this way or that way. It's always exactly the same, the same spiral, the same sign of the spiral. Uh, this is the reason why you get materials that, that can, can, can make the polarization state of light rotate. You flip them end to end, they look exactly the same. There's some, there's something just worth knowing, okay? Um, and uh, somehow, what happened? Chiral structures, springs look completely safe. Oh, right, completely safe, and vice versa. I don't know, something's happened to my computer. I'm sure I didn't intend that. Anyway, never mind. The important thing is the first thing here. So let's think about helically twisted PCF. And I'm calling this orbital angular momentum, OAM, and the mystery of the spectral dips. This is an Agatha Christie mystery story for you. <laughs> well, anyway, the mystery of the spectral dips. So there's the straight and the twisted. Once again, English for you, these have double meanings. But don't think about that. And we're taking a very simple solid core PCF. On the left, you have a straight one. It's just pulled straight. Core index is higher than cladding, so you have total internal reflection guidance. These are the hollow channels. And on the right, we have a twisted version of this. And if you imagine, you think about the core mode that sits in the solid glass core, it's not going to be perfectly circular. I think it's pretty obvious from what I've been saying earlier that the mode is going to kind of have spokes that sort of stick in, stick out in between the, in between the hollow channels. It's going to look a little bit like this, this hexagon. So it's not a perfectly circular mode. It's somehow locked, it's somehow locked like, like a cog wheel. It's kind of locked to the, to the hollow channel structure in both cases. So what happens when it travels along? Well, it's pretty obvious. The, the, the mode in the twisted fiber will be forced to rotate, whereas the mode in the straight fiber just goes along without changing. So there's a fundamental difference between these two modes. One of them is, is being forced to rotate. This must have some effect on its propagation characteristics because it's changing as it travels. It doesn't look like an eigenmode. I mean, you think about an eigenmode. An eigenmode is something that travels through the structure without changing. It's typically what we think of as an eigenmode with a constant phase velocity and a constant kind of field distribution. But in this case, that's not the case. It's a, it, the field distribution is spinning. So it, 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 it's, it's changing as it travels along. So, but, it, but it still is an eigenmode of, of the structure. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. So what are the consequences of this twisting? Well, one of the things, I'll talk about this a little bit later, one of the things that this does for you is it, it induces optical activity. And we're, we're used to, to the fact that chiral structures cr create optical activity. This optical activity is when the linear polarization state of the light rotates as it, as it travels through the material. So if you have a chiral a molecule in solution and you pass light through it, you'll see the polarization state of the light rotate in a direction that depends on the chirality of the molecules. Okay, so we get to see the same thing here. 
So we've, we, it does actually exhibit optical activity. And in fact, the idea of, of using a, a structured core like this to create optical activity dates back to 1986 with this paper by Con Hussey and one of his uh, students, I think, back then in Southampton, did some theoretical studies of this. And it wasn't until PCF came along that we were able to observe it, actually, in this, this recent, well, relatively recent paper. But that's not what I want to talk about. This mystery I was saying. So the mystery is that if you take a twisted fiber like this, uh, but you don't take it, you have to know how to make it, first of all. So let me show you how we make it, or one of the ways we make it. We take a length of straight fiber, we fix one end, we put the other end in a motor, have it, have it rotating, and we scan a carbon dioxide laser beam. This is a 10 micron wavelength laser beam reflected off the mirror, and that little white dot is the fiber being heated up to its softening temperature. If you get the conditions right, you can then create a structure that looks just like this. Um, you have to get the power of the laser right correctly, and the, uh, everything has to be right, otherwise it doesn't work. But but it does work pretty well when you, when you do it correctly. After that, if we look, use a microscope and look through the side, we, you, you see a striped pattern. And these stripes just correspond to the flat edges of the, of the hexagon. So you can see the, this is what, what we're seeing here. So six of these correspond to one twist period. So L is the pitch, as we call it, the pitch, the, the length over which the channel comes back to its original position. Um, OK. So this, this is a very versatile way of making twisted fiber, but you can also do it during the fiber drawing process. So there, as I showed you, we got a preform. You just have to spin the preform in, or the cane, what I call this, the cane, in, in the final, the second stage of the drawing process. Um, you, you, you spin that very fast, and you can end up then with hundreds of meters of twisted, of twisted fiber, if you want. So the mystery are these unexpected dips. And, I mean, I'm using the word mystery, and I really do mean mystery. For me, it was a mystery at the beginning. There was actually a paper from another group a couple of years before where they'd observed this, but they'd completely failed to explain these dips. They had a kind of explanation, but it, but it, it just didn't, didn't work, because if you took their theoretical expression and compared it with the experiment, they didn't agree. They not just didn't agree, they were radically different. <laughs> Which is interesting. But anyway, this is what you see. So we, we take the twisted fiber, we put in broadband light, and we look at what comes through. And this is a typical, two typical measurements. You see these weird dips in the spectrum. In this case, you can see three, and there might be a fourth one. You can't really see it so well. But if we increase the twist rate, so make the pitch smaller. Twist rate, by the way, is 2 pi over the, over the pitch. Did I define that somewhere? The two pi over the two pi over the over the pitch is what I call the twist rate alpha. And so we, we increase the twist rate, and what we find is that these dips move out to longer wavelength in a very reproducible way. So D is moved out to here, C is moved to here, B to here, and so on. So we did many many measurements of this, um, and also did some simulations just to check that you know that Maxwell's equations kind of agreed with what we measured. And in fact, these, these yellow curves are the results of simulations, which pretty much they agree reasonably well with the, with, the, with the actual measurements. So with many, many measurements, we then plotted the, um, we, 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 we were then able to get a lot of data and, and maybe and use the data to try and work out what was going on, because I couldn't explain these dips initially. So it was only when I realized that, um, that uh, this, this twisting of the fiber um, had, had, a, had a very interesting effect, particularly in the cladding. I didn't do that, did I? Maybe I did. I think I can move the mouse around with this, can't I? Ah, there we are. That's great. It's gone now, anyway. <laughs> so I realized, after, after a few months of struggling with this, I realized that if you think about the cladding and you think about the light in the cladding, the hollow channels, if I put some light in the cladding, not on the core, but in the cladding, if I put light in here, it's going to be kind of trapped between the hollow channels. There's a blob of light that will be trapped in that space, and also in this space, and also in this space, sort of all through the cladding. Um, and if, you, if I launch that mode in, it's going, to be forced, it's going to be forced to rotate, clearly, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't have any chance. It doesn't have any option. It's being forced to rotate by the hollow channels. So it's no longer going in a straight line. It's no longer going just straight along the fiber. It's actually going around a helical path. So I looked down on top of this structure, and think about wave vectors. I look at the top view of the structure. These would be the, 
the, the angle of the hollow channels at some particular value of radius, because that angle increases as you move further away from the axis, then I know that there is that the light in the cladding has what we call uh, it's called a fundamental space filling mode. It's it's the in that very first picture I, I showed you, I said there was a, a maximum refractive index that the photonic crystal fiber cladding could, could sustain. And beyond that, the light became evanescent. It was that line, if you remember. So that refractive index actually on that line is, what, is the index of what we call the fundamental space filling mode, and I'm calling it NSM here. This, this is the maximum refractive index that this, this photonic crystal fiber cladding can support. So if I think of light with that maximum index, it's been going around a helical path. It's at some angle to the axis. Phi will depend on the radius and on the twist rate, this angle. I can decompose this refractive index into a component in the azimuthal direction and a component in the, in the axial direction, just, just by geometry. And then you think about this component. This is going to be going around in a circle. Okay, so there's a component that's going in the azimuthal direction. It's going to go around like this. So I can take this, this wave vector and I can just trace it around a circle like this and count up the number of periods um, around the circumference. So I take 2 pi over lambda, some particular wave length, multiply by the refractive index, multiply by 2 pi times the radius, which is the circumference, and that will have to equal a multiple of 2 pi in order to have a resonance. I mean, if the, if the light, when it goes around once, is not in phase with itself, you don't get a mode, the definition of a mode. The, the light has to be in phase everywhere within the, within the resonance. So you can count the number of periods around here. And in fact, that would be what we call the OAM order, the order of the orbital angular momentum, how, many, how much momentum is, is actually going around an azimuthal path. OK, so we put, put this simple model in and do some simple mathematics. We, we end up with, uh, with this expression, realizing that phi can be approximated as just alpha times rho, it turns out, um, because the angle here is very small. Um, so we can approximate that. And we end up then with this expression, which, is, which shows us that the, the twist rate is proportional to the wavelength of the dip multiplied by the order of the orbital angular momentum. So how many periods we have around the circumference here? OK, so that very simple expression suggests that the wavelength of the dip should be proportional to the twist rate, which is exactly what you see in the data. So here we have twist rate, and here we have wavelength of the dips. These, da these are the data points, and they lie almost perfectly on straight lines satisfying this, this equation, provided we choose the right value of the constants. I and mean, that's something we just have to choose to get the fit. But once you've got the value, it works for all the modes. And all these lines go through zero very nicely. Um, when I first plotted this, I couldn't believe it. it did, I was just so amazed that it fitted so well. Because previously, <laughs> previously, what we were doing was plotting the helical pitch to one over this versus wavelength. And you got these curves that made no sense at all. You know, obviously, if you take the reciprocal of this and plot the same diagram, you don't get something that looks like that. You get some weird curves. And I couldn't connect that to the physics at all. Um, the reason I was plotting this was that in a very simple-minded way, I said, this is a long period grading. Does anyone work on long period gradings? You know about gradings? Somebody must know about gradings. I mean, the thing about gratings is that's a periodic structure that scatters light. Is, is that uh, there's a condition usually for resonance. And it's, it, OK, it may look quite complicated, but the basic message is that the wavelength at which the resonance happens, at which the light gets reflected in Bragg scattering, for example, is proportional to the pitch. If you make the pitch bigger, the wavelength gets bigger. So they scale together. Um, so I was looking for that. I thought it must be a long period grading effect of some sort. It's got to be that. So we plot this, and it made no sense. Didn't fit to any theory. Um, and then, then I was then finally dawned on me that maybe there's something to do with OAM. And so I plotted the reciprocal, and we got this perfect fit to the simple theory. It's one of the most exciting moments in the last few years for me. And when you're struggling with something, you can't make sense of it. And all of a sudden, you realize, my god, I'm so stupid. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, yeah. So it's exciting.
So we finally understood that these dips are caused by resonances in the cladding that carry orbital angular momentum. And we can even work out the orders of these individual dips just by fitting that theory to the, to the data. And we were able to work out that the orders of the OAM were 5, 6, 7, and 8. So there's a number of periods around, around the circumference. Um, and in fact, this mode order is not very well. The resolution isn't very good. That's this L. This L is the OAM order. And what's that, what that's, what's that, that is doing is telling us if I have a Oh, that doesn't work very well, does it? Go more slowly. So I have a circle, and I start up here, and I go an angle phi around the circumference. Then L would tell me the optical phase. Phase. I don't know if you can read this or not. Optical phase divided by phi. So it's it's the the optical phase advance, I should call that, really. You probably can't read this. I'm writing it too small. So the, the, the light is, 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 is progressing around the circumference at a certain phase velocity. Okay. So the, 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 the amount by which the optical phase increases per unit angle is L. So if I go around 2 pi, then the, then the angle phi is 2 pi. I multiply this by 2 pi. I get, I get a certain multiple of 2 pi for the optical phase. So if L equals 6, for example, I will get 6 times 2 pi for the optical phase. I get 12 pi. I go right round. If L equals 1, I get, uh, I get 2 pi. If L equals minus 1, I get minus 2 pi. So th that's the meaning of this L parameter. OK, and here are some pictures of these mysterious modes. Um, using finite element modeling. We weren't able to, to actually take pictures of these in the lab, I mean, because they turn out to be very lossy um, for reasons which I'll explain uh, in, a, in a moment. So these, these, these modes are extremely lossy. This is the reason you get a dip, actually. You know, if they, but they weren't lossy, you wouldn't get a dip. You could actually collect all the power at the end. It might look a bit funny, because some of the light would be in this mode and some in the core. But, uh, but that isn't the case. You can't see these modes in the experiment because the light just leaks away completely out of the structure. But th they all look different. But they all have this feature, two features. They look ring-shaped. That's a particularly nice ring. That's a bit of a scattered ring. But, but this is, um, again, quite a nice ring. Another thing you'll notice is that they have, they have what looks like full symmetry. So they have six periods, one, two, three, four, five, six, and it repeats. That's true of all of these structures. They repeat six times as you go around, if you just look at them. Um, and um, yeah, so we explained it pretty much. So just, just coming back to this picture that I, I drew here, um, you, can, you, you can analyze this. You can think about these modes as um, what I call helical block modes. Um, is there, anyone work with photonic block waves? Must is that something some of you worked on, block waves? No? No? Nobody? Really? Nobody works in photonic crystals? Somebody, OK. Yeah, somebody knows a bit about it. All right. It's helpful if you've thought a little bit about photonic block waves. But anyway, you, you may have studied block waves in your undergraduate uh, studies, if you did physics. Um, and, and a block wave, very simply expressed, is 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 the the, the 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 is a representation of the eigenmode of the light in a periodic structure. Um, so we have some kind of periodic structure. In this case, it's periodic azimuthally. So these 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 the structure itself repeats six times as we go around. So the, these holes and so on repeat each time. So it looks like a periodic structure in the azimuthal dimension. And a Bloch wave, and this was realized by Felix Bloch a long time ago, in 19. 40s or 30s, I don't know, but he, he realized that, that you, if, you, if you had a field, if you represented the field of the light and of electrons, actually, in his case, the electrons in the crystal, if you represented the field, the, the probability function of the electrons in terms of a periodic function that had exactly the same period as the periodic structure, you multiply that by a, a phase factor, which tells you how much the phase is changing from one period to the next. And you get that, and you put that into the equations, 
Schrodinger's equation, you solve it, you find that the electrons, and this is his phrase, the electrons were able to sneak through this periodic structure with no scattering. Sneak through is exactly the right word. I mean, how on earth can a wave go through this complicated scattering thing with lots of atoms sitting there? It goes through smoothly, it doesn't get scattered, comes out the other side as if it, nothing had happened. It's a sort of magic idea, that. And you can do the same thing with light. Um, so here we have, for this more complicated case, forgetting about the fact that it's helical for the moment, just look at, look at this picture. We have a periodic function. Let's make the twist rate zero for the moment. So there's no twist. We have a periodic function that repeats every so often in phi. It repeats every, what is it, 2 pi over 6, pi over 3, as you go around here. It's the periodic function. It's a perfectly periodic function. We multiply by a term that tells you how much the optical phase is changing. And I've illustrated that here. The optical phase is changing as e to the i, the L value, times phi. That's this L value I talked about over here. So as I go round, when I go round the complete circumference, I get 2 pi times, times uh, this, this L parameter for the block wave. OK, so that's the description of a block wave. And you can show that that will give you a good description of the fields in an untwisted fiber. But then, of course, it's twisted. And these fields are no longer able to go in a straight line. They're being forced to rotate as they travel. Um, and to get the field to rotate, we have to do a tweak. We have to tweak Bloch's theorem. We, we have to put in this term, which depends on distance along the axis, z or z, multiplied by the twist rate alpha. And that then forces this pattern to twist as it travels. OK, and if you, it turns out if you put this into Maxwell's equations, out pops very nice solutions to this problem in this helicoidal, in this sort of helical, helical structure. OK, you can calculate everything else here. This is the propagation constant of the block wave along the axis, and, and so on. Um, and something else that um, is important about block waves, I mean, if you have a periodic function, you can always decompose that using a Fourier series into harmonics. It's, it's straightforward to do that. And so we get harmonics. And if you, you do take harmonics of this function, we will find that um, you, you need to have harmonics because to create a periodic pattern like this in the fields, you need to interfere light going this way with light going this way. Yeah? You have to superimpose those to create an interference pattern. If you want to create some complicated interference pattern like this, you may need several other harmonics in order to create this pattern, just like you need to do in a Fourier series. So it, it turns out that in analyzing a block wave just by, by decomposing the periodic function into a Fourier series, we then end up with not just this value of L, but we end up with this value of L, um, uh, which will depend on the harmonic that we're looking at. If, if the harmonic is um, is, is zero, for example, then L will be six in this case. But we can also have, um, <clears throat> for, the, for the first harmonic, it will be two, so we'd get 12. When n equals three, we get 24. We get a whole lot of different harmonics, and can, can be negative as well. So we could get zero, we could get minus one, that would give you minus six. So we get all these harmonics, and they all have different values of, o, of OAM. So this is a very curious eigenmode. It's, it has multiple values of orbital angular momentum. And each of these harmonics, turns out, has a different propagation constant along the axis because the alpha z is in here as well. We do a Fourier series expansion of this. We don't just get a harmonics in phi. We get harmonics in z as well. So we're actually adding and subtracting multiples of alpha z to beta. So I could take, say, n equals 1. I would find I wouldn't have a propagation constant beta b. I'd have beta b plus alpha, or beta b minus alpha, or minus 2 alpha, or whatever the, whatever the number is um, that we're putting into the n here. And once again, that's obvious, too. We can create this periodic pattern at one point in space, but we know that when we travel down the fiber, it has to spin. And it, the only way it can spin is, is if each, each of the harmonics that create this pattern has a different propagation constant along the axis. Yeah? Because this means that the relative phase between them will change. And if the relative phase between two interfering waves change, the fringe moves. 
So, so in a way, this is this 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 uh, ANSATS, this trial solution, is telling us everything about the physics, about what it has to be in this case. Okay, how are you all feeling? Are you exhausted? <clears throat> I need some water, actually. <laughs> anyway, you're going to have a nice um, a nice uh, event this evening, no? <coughs> Where's Gustavo gone? There you are. Juice and water. Juice and water? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And you're going to have a very special lecture just before it, too, I think. Yeah. Good. Much better than what I'm saying. Anyway. Much more fun. <laughs> OK, so that's, that's OAM and the mystery of the spectral dips. <clears throat> uh, something, I'd like to talk about something else, topological effects. What do I mean here? Topological phase matching. Because it turns out there's, there's another aspect to these twisted fibers that's really fascinating. And this has to do with, the, again, with the fact that, of course, with the fact that they're twisted. It all has to do with being twisted. Um, but let's think about an untwisted fiber, first of all. There's no twist. And let's think about refractive index. So this is the, um, the refractive index of, of the different materials. Um, and actually, I'm thinking about refractive index in the axial direction. Um, so I might have a solid glass core with refractive index material as the index of silica. Then I have the hollow channels, which have index 1. And then I have some other glass, bits of glass, that are, are thinner than the core, which are these bits. So this is just a kind of sketch of cross-section of the index distribution of, of one of these fibers. And of course, we know that there's going to be a guided mode in the core. And the guided mode in the core has to sit between the refractive index of silica and the maximum refractive index that the cladding can support, which is the refractive index of the fundamental space filling mode that I've talked about several times. OK, that's this red line. So we have a step index waveguide. Index step goes from this index to the, to the index up here. And we can get a guided mode that sits somewhere in between. OK, that's the guided mode. What happens when we twist it? This is what happens. I've already said that the light, instead of going in a straight line in the cladding, at some point in the cladding, it's being forced to describe a helical path. And if you think about a fiber this long, length L, and instead of going in a straight line, I, I do this, then clearly the overall path length will be longer, because I'm spending all my time going around <laughs> in a spiral. Um, and this is a purely geometrical effect. It's got nothing to do with waves or group velocity or phase velocity. It's pure geometry. Both the group velocity and the phase velocity are reduced because of this. If I measure the, the time it takes to go from here to here, it's, uh, the phase will be delayed and also the group velocity will be delayed. Which Normally that's kind of weird because we think you increase the group velocity, you reduce the phase velocity, and there's a kind of trade-off. But this is, this is just pure geometry, nothing more than that. It takes a bit of getting used to, actually. But. And this is exactly what happens in the fibers. Because if you think about light that's in the cladding, which is trapped in, in the glass strands between the hollow channels, it's kind of forced to go around this helical path. And the further you go out in radius, the longer this path becomes. And in fact, you can show very easily that the, that the, uh, the, the, the effective refractive index is proportional to the radius squared. So, so we get a distortion to this refractive index diagram that looks just like this. Just because of geometry. But it has one wonderful consequence, which is that if we twist it right, we can get to a position where the refractive index of the cladding mode, of this fundamental space filling mode, it's now in kind of rings because it has different refractive index depending where you are in, in radius. But you can find a position where the where the cladding light phase matches to the core light. Because when, when waves have the same refractive index, they can couple to each other strongly. So we get leakage of light from here to a mode that sits maybe, maybe here, if we get the twist rate correct. And this is the reason why the light is able to couple to these ring-shaped modes that carry orbital angular momentum in the cladding. Another thing you'll notice is that if we do create a ring-shaped mode at this point, it's going to refract outwards because the refractive index is continuing to go up. It's not going to stay trapped there. It's going to, it's going to disappear out of the structure. 
which is the reason we get high loss in, the, in these modes. Now this is not a new idea. This is not a new idea. In, in fact, um, this guy here, Rudy Kampfner, or Rudolf Kampfner, I should call him, although he was, was a, a part-time PhD supervisor of mine when I was at Oxford. There he is at Bell Labs with John Pierce, and I uh, forget who this guy is, but John Pierce is another famous name um, from the 1940s and 1950s. So in the 1940s, he was Austrian, actually. Let me tell you about him. It's, it's fun. This, this guy is amazing. He, he was Austrian. I think he was, he was Jewish. He got out of Europe, you know, it was a bad time. He escaped from Europe. Uh, he was trained as an architect. Austrian family, I think, trained as an architect, but got interested in engineering. And uh, he became a director at Bell Labs, very influential. And at the end of his life, he was a professor at Stanford. So he started as an architect and then ended up as a, a really innovative scientist, just amazing. He used to. He used to come up with new ideas. He didn't do it in the normal way with mathematics and just sitting thinking. He, he used a drawing board. He was an architect after all. So he sharpened his pencil, took out his drawing board and drew stuff. Yeah? So one of the things he drew was this. I don't think this isn't, this isn't his drawing, but, but, but he got the idea by just looking at the geometry, at the topology of, of, of A, and, and came up with the traveling wave tube. That was his invention. He has the original patent on this. And the idea here was rather wonderful. Um, the, the idea, he realized that, that if you had a, an elect, you could create an electron beam in those days, and you, could, you couldn't really make them uh, relativistic. You couldn't make them go really fast, but, but you could make them go pretty fast. What he wanted to do was use the electrons to amplify a microwave signal, but they travel at different velocities, so you can't, you can't match their velocities. But if you send the microwave signal around a spiral path, you're essentially slowing down its, its velocities, slowing down its phase velocity and its group velocity. And by doing this, you can then match the, uh, match the phase velocities of the electrons and, and the microwave and, and make a very, <coughs> very efficient amplifier just by tuning, tuning the, um, <coughs> the velocity of the electrons, making them more energetic, less energetic. Depending on that, depending on the relative velocities, you can make an amplifier or an attenuator. Um, and this is a very, very important device. It was used in all the radar systems until recently. Um, uh, it's a wonderful broadband amplifier. And, it, and the principle of this twisted PCF is just the same, yeah, except we're doing it with light here, from light to light. It's, here it's from electrons to light, uh, to, to microwaves. Let's see, what am I doing? Ooh. It seems like I'm getting close to the point where I should stop, Gustavo. Yeah? Do you want me to stop? I mean, I, I can continue this tomorrow. Or I can go on for five, ten minutes. What, what do you want? Your call. Or maybe we should ask you guys. What do you want? You want to do some questions? I don't want to keep you too late. So, yeah, let's go to questions. Professor Philip, uh, when you talk about this uh, twisting optical mode, in that uh, it seems like the optical fiber is uh, giving light its angular momentum. Yeah, right? it's yeah. rotating. It's, it's like an impeller. But if, if you at first launch li uh, light without any angular momentum, I would expect that the angular momentum would come from somewhere, or at least go to somewhere in an opposite direction to cancel it. Yeah, uh, I th yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, you can, you can launch light into the fiber, and, and, and the, the light will be, will, be, will be given angular momentum. momentum. It's a bit like you say you have a propeller, you, and you fix it. You don't make it rotate, but you, but you force, force past it. Then you create a vortex afterwards. Yeah? So, so the structure itself, the photonic crystal fiber structure itself, is not rotating. So it, it provides the, the torque that gives the light angular momentum. I think that's the way to look at it. And, be, and because it's chiral, it, it, it'll only go in one, in one direction. But actually, it's a bit more complex than that, but basically. I, 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 I describe it as an optical impeller that creates optical vortices. Yeah. So then the fiber gets torque? Yeah, it would be. Yes, it, it'll, it will, uh, yeah, yeah, very tiny torque, of course. But uh, if you could measure it, it would be there. Um, 
And, uh, and in fact, I mean, this is known. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there are experiments where people have taken little chiral-shaped objects and trapped them using optical tweezers and seen them seen them rotate. So, but this is a big lump of glass. With, <laughs> so you're not you're not going to see it there. Uh, I don't know what, but I, I feel that when the uh, the light is rotating in the uh, twisted fiber and its mode structure is changing continuously, so does it s feel some constant uh, resistance in propagation or does it have some kind of reflection which gets cancelled over time? There's no reflection, but, but you're right, there, there should be some kind of resistance um, because the light is continuously being forced to turn a corner. At every point, it's being forced, because it's going around a helical path, it's being forced to turn a corner all the time. If you like the local coordinate system, it, there's a, I don't know if you know about these, the coordinate systems of curved, of, 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 of curves in space, but, but there's a, you can come up with a local coordinate system where you have the tangent to the curve, you have, uh, you have the normal to, to the curve, and then you have another one which is called the torsion, which tells you how the thing is rotating. And um, this, this, if you follow the follow the thing around, it's it's uh, the, the light is being um, uh, it's, it's sort of it's be, because it's being forced to turn. There, there, there's obviously going to be a transfer of momentum to the to the glass. Because just like if you have a particle, light comes in, hits it, and gets reflected, then each photon that gets reflected will give you twice the photon momentum to the particle. But this time, it's a much smaller effect, but nevertheless, it's there. And, uh, and it creates torque. Does this for something like impedance mismatch, uh, which can give rise to tiny reflections? Yeah, I mean, this this basically is impedance mismatch. Yes, between between the at, at the interface between the glass and the and the air in this case. Yeah, I mean, the, the impedance mismatch is what allows the light to be reflected, and allows you to transfer the momentum from the light to the to the glass. Yeah, Thank you. that's right. Any other question? Uh, professor, when you show the uh, mode pattern uh, for the this this twisted fibers, yeah, uh, you said that the, that the azimuthal number there, the L, yeah, shows some pattern that, that has this L like at five, six, seven, eight, like yeah. really sequential, yeah, but. I'm thinking, uh, doesn't it have to do some have to do some relation with the hexagonal uh, period in this case? Uh, I don't know. It seems like there's no uh, relation between this L and the actual shape of the fiber. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, well, it it has to do with the fact that it's sixfold symmetric. So so the number of, the number of periods around uh, one full circumference is six of, of the structure. Yeah, but uh, the L there says, says that uh, L equals seven, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're going to have like a s well, seven, seven, seven times uh, two pi. You, you you, around, for, that particular, for that particular harmonic, yeah? So if I, I take seven, for example, that would be this point. But then because it's a block wave and because the fields are periodic, I know that seven has to be accompanied because it's, there are six periods in the structure. It has to be accompanied by something that with by one. So seven minus six. Seven plus six is 13. 7 minus 12, which is minus 5. And those are, those are all harmonics of the block wave as well. And they all have slightly different propagation constants along the axis, as I was saying. Uh, by, I think it's different by alpha. I forget what it is. But it's a constant difference. And, and this, is, this is what allows the pattern to rotate as it travels. But no, it's a good question, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was going to talk a bit more about this in the next, next half. But I, I could ask you guys if you want to hear more about this, actually, because I, I won't have time to do everything. Uh, I need to go back to my talk. So these are the topics. I can do more of this tomorrow, or I can stop, or I can do this. So I'm sort of asking you, if I'm asking for a democratic vote. Do you want some problems or not? I mean, Can you print this or something? Or? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll post it online so you guys can look at it and we can discuss it. Uh, but let me just explain them a little bit. So this, this has to do with the hollow, a hollow waveguide. I talked about this earlier, earlier on. It's basically asking you to calculate the refractive index and dispersion of the fundamental mode of a, of, of a vacuum-filled hollow core waveguide and how it changes if you put something in the core. Uh, this has to do with block waves. 
that might, I mean, some of you might find that easy, some not. It's actually a very easy derivation. But it's, it's an array of parallel single mode waveguides that are co have a coupling constant between them, which is, say, kappa or something like that. And it's asking you to derive the dispersion relation. And that's a bit more complicated. That has to do with the topic I might not get to talk about. And this has to do with, uh, with the twisted structures, about this topological thing that I was telling you, where the path length increases when you twist it. That's something you could tackle. I wouldn't bother with this one, but this one. Um, yeah, and this one is a question about the transverse effective wavelength. Actually, it's quite important. I think, I think if you grasp this, the physics of this, it'll help a lot when you think about waveguides, and it's quite a simple calculation, really. And this is also interesting, um, using a very simple and a very analysis very, very sim similar to this one. So in this case, it's an array of waveguides on a plane. In this case, it's just three waveguides in a ring that are coupled to each other with a coupling constant, and it's asking you to work out the eigenmodes of that three-waveguide that three waveguide system, and then relate these eigenmodes to modes that carry orbital angular momentum. So, so it sort of links into twisted stuff. Okay. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Philip again, and uh, I'll give you some instructions. Um, were you gonna head, you guys gonna head to the hotel, I guess, to drop your bags, um, and as soon as you are ready, you can, I think, uh, walk towards the the Lado B pub. I'm gonna plug the the map here. is about a few hundred meters away from the hotel you guys are staying, so. Hopefully you don't get too drunk there, and you can still <laughs> manage to go back to the hotel afterwards. Uh, remember, tomorrow we have activities at 8.30 uh, a.m. Is that correct? Yes. So it's, yeah, don't, don't overdo it. Um,